Thank you, Dean. Good morning, everybody. Talking today about the regulation of carbon sequestration in WA rangelands, um, very exciting. Before we launch, in, launch into this, um, for a little bit of context, I'd like to take a bit of a step back and, and go through um, some offsets basics um, and explain why we're looking at carbon sequestration specifically today, uh, which I know Barry touched on um, to kick us off. Is that working for people at the back there? No? Testing, testing. Um, how about that now, are we working? Sounds a bit better. So there, there are two types of um, offsets projects which can generate carbon credits for sale. Um, sequestration projects and uh, emissions avoidance or abatement projects. The regulatory requirements for abatement projects are a lot simpler um, because we're talking about avoiding greenhouse gas emissions uh, there completely in the, first, well, in the first place rather than storing carbon. So we don't have uh, a couple of problems, if, if you like, that plague um, the regulatory side of things here. Um, those problems being we haven't got any permanency requirements and we don't have a requirement to uh, have a proof of a carbon sequestration right um, for abatement projects. Abatement projects do have valuable application to the WA rangelands. Um, think um, savannah burning uh, projects in the Kimberley specifically but also more generally for pastoralists. Um, Peter mentioned uh, briefly during his talk that there's a, um, various methodologies under the CFI that, that might be useful for pastoralists. One of those um, is called the beef cattle herd management methodology, and that involves pastoralists earning past, uh, carbon credits through the adoption of measures to reduce emissions intensity of beef production which involves increasing herd productivity to achieve market weight earlier, lowering emissions over an animal's or over a herd's lifetime. Um, so that's, it sounds like, you know, perfectly fine, best pastoral practice that you can employ and potentially earn carbon credits from as an abatement project. Abatement projects like that and, uh, and the, the Savannah burning projects that you would have heard of are underway. Um, they're the, the easier projects and they're, I guess, leading the way in some sense in, in, this, in the offsets field. The focus of today, of course, is on carbon sequestration projects. One of the reasons for that is that is where the bulk of the value uh, of carbon farming in WA rangelands is expected to come from. It's the basis of the economic modelling that has been done in some reports that, that tells us we have a new billion dollar industry waiting to happen in the, in the rangelands for, for, for carbon farming. Part of it also, part of the importance of sequestration projects is the, is the importance of the co-benefits um, generated by sequestration projects. We have a range of social and environmental benefits of increasing the productivity of the Western Australian rangelands that comes with um, offsets projects that, that, that we can use as a, as a carbon sequestration project. But perhaps the most important uh, reason why we're focusing on sequestration projects today is that there are various regulatory um, and other issues that need to be worked through so that sequestration projects can happen um, in our rangelands and, and that's a big part, of course, of, of, of uh, what today is about. So carbon farming. Um, I think most of us will have a, a good appreciation of what that means. It's basically about producing and selling um, carbon credits. And at a very basic level, to produce carbon credits, you need to register uh, an offsets project under an accreditation scheme. You need to offset greenhouse gas emissions in some way in accordance with the rules that apply to your project. And then you need, once you've done that, you get um, <coughs> issued with carbon credits that are accredited by the scheme. Now, there are various um, accreditation schemes out there. 
non-governmental schemes like um, the Verified Carbon Standard um, and Gold Standard, which I'm sure we'll hear more about today um, from, from Kent, among others. Uh, but obviously we also have um, the Australian Government scheme, the Carbon Farming Initiative, or, or CFI, under the Carbon Credits Carbon Farming, Farming Initiative Act of 2011. Peter referred uh, earlier to the, the ERF, for CFI, in, in my presentation, read ER, ERF, which has been obviously bolted onto the CFI effectively um, following the, the last change of government we had. I'm not going to be talking um, in any detail today about how these different accreditation schemes work. Focus today is on um, the WA range regulations that need to be navigated in order to, to register and, and offset projects and start generating carbon credits um, from that carb, uh, offsets project. Having said that, um, I'll talk quickly about um, some of the basic requirements for um, a CFI offsets project to, to register one and get it up and running. Two of those, additional, additionality and, and permanence, are are quite fundamental to the way um, any accreditation scheme works. They're critical to the integrity um, of the accreditation scheme. Um, it is critical to the integrity of the, the, the scheme that it's creating a lasting reduction in greenhouse gases, which wouldn't be created in the ordinary course, which is what, um, in a nutshell, those two criteria are about. A quick look at the uh, the regulation of Western Australian pastoral leases shows that we've got some potential issues with, with meeting those two fundamental requirements. Some of the issues are, are more real um, than others. Starting at additionality, we have uh, a Lands Administration Act, um, which again, a lot of you will be familiar with, that governs pastoral leases and requires a pastoral SE to use methods of best pastoral and environmental management practice for the management of stock and for the management, conservation and regeneration of pasture for grazing. Sounds good from a regulatory point of view. Uh, good for the protection and improvement of the pastoral industry and in the environment, but does that pose a problem for the additionality requirement and in particular the requirement that for a CFI project to, to to be registered, it has to go beyond business as usual, and in particular, comply with uh, beyond compliance with legislative requirements. So we've got this very broad uh, um, requirement as part of the Land Administration Act that we do everything in accordance with best pastoral and environmental practice. Does that cause an issue for a CFI project? taking the, the beef cattle herd management methodology, for example, that I just spoke about briefly. It sounds like best management practice, best pastoral practice. Do we have an additionality problem? Um, there's a, a proposed rangelands restoration methodology, which again, we'll hear more about um, um, later on today. Uh, eff effectively and essentially that aims to boost carbon stores and, and vegetation and and soils in the rangelands through a range of management practices, um, including managing water flows, burning practices, sensitive grazing practices. A again, isn't that best pastoral and environmental practice? And do we have an additionality problem there? Um, another potential issue with WA permanent uh, pastoral leases is permanence. The, the fundamental requirement under the CFI, or the, the, the more usual one, um, is that you store carbon that you sequester for 100 years. Maximum term of pastoral lease is 50 years. We've got a problem. A problem that has been mitigated in, in more recent times by amendments to the CFI to allow a permanency period of 25 years. But that comes at a cost because you can only get credits for 70% of the carbon you store as part of your project under a 25 year permanency period as opposed to 95% of the carbon, carbon you store under a 100 year permanency um, situation. So there's, a, there's an inefficiency that's built in to the difference between those regimes for, for um, Western Australian pastoral leases as they exist at the moment, potentially. Um, the other uh, basic requirements that I mentioned there, an approved methodology um, 
as I said, methodology imposes the, the rules for, a, for an offsets project, including about how additionality and permanency requirements are, are captured and, and um, satisfied, measuring the carbon stored and, and therefore how many um, carbon credits can be generated. The point with uh, an approved methodology is we, we need one that works um, for the land that, that you're on um, and for the, for the business that you're in. Again, I've mentioned a rangelands restoration methodology. Um, yeah, that is the methodology that is perhaps most obviously uh, has most application in the WA rangelands, as opposed to methodologies you know, to do with planting forests or, or even mallees that are not quite so handy for, for, for people in the outback. But the fourth, or well, the, the number three um, requirement there that I mentioned, land tenure is, is really the one that I'll spend much most time talking about today. As an offset um, project proponent, you'll need two things as part of land tenure more broadly. One is the, the carbon sequestration rights in relation to your land, or at least the consent of the person who has those rights to, to run your project. And the second is the right to conduct the, the relevant sequestration activity on your land. Both of those components are problematic, um, as things stand at the moment, for much of the Western Australian rangelands. So walking through those requirements, carbon sequestration right, what is it? As you'll see on the screen there, it's the exclusive legal right to obtain the benefit of the sequestration of carbon on project land. How do you get it in Western Australia? Quite simple, uh, and we have the legislation there already. You register a carbon right on the certificate of title to your project land, covering the area that you're going to conduct your, your project on. The Carbon Rights Act says that registering a carbon right in Western Australia on your land, whether it be freehold land or, or crown land, is the only way to get hold of this carbon sequestration right in Western Australia. There is an exception to that, not under Western Australian regulation, but under Commonwealth regulation, and that's that the CFI automatically gives um, the native title holders of exclusive possession native title land the carbon sequestration right in relation to that land, so to facilitate their involvement in, in um, CFI projects. The potential difficulties around carbon sequestration right have been alleviated in more recent times by some amendments to the CFI Act that, um, to the effect that you, don't, you no longer need as the project proponent the carbon sequestration rights themselves. It's enough to, for you to get the consent of the person who holds those carbon sequestration rights. Um, and the other um, element of, of land tenure that I mentioned is the, is the possession right. Um, I've stepped through um, how those, those two components work in turn. How do you register a carbon right? Process again is simple in, as far as the actual legislative requirements. Firstly, you obtain the consent of anyone with a registered interest in the project land. Note that under the, the, the Carbon Rights Act, this doesn't include the holder of native title rights um, if, if there's one affecting your land, which in, in many cases in the rangelands, of course, there is. But that that requirement is, exists at a separate level because under the CFI, before you can register a project, you have to specifically obtain the consent of, of a native title holder. What does that mean? Well, for freehold land, there is a bit of it in our range lands. Um, you, you need the consent of the owner of the land to register the, the carbon right. If there's a bank or mortgage, you need the, the consent of the mortgagee. Any other registered encumbrance holders need that consent. How about for unallocated crown land, UCL, or you need the consent of the, the Minister for Lands. Past release, the same deal. You need the, the consent of the Minister of Lands, um, and if you don't happen to be the pastoral lessee and you're applying for a, a CFI project, you need the consent of the, the pastoral lessee. Second step is to, is to register a land gate form, pretty straightforward one, the, the CR, CR1 form, uh, the carbon right form. Um, contains all the usual details you'd expect to see on a land gate form. Um, who you are as a carbon right holder, your address, how long your carbon right um, exists for, which can be um, 
any period of time up to forever in perpetuity. Um, and once you've done that, once you've registered that carbon right, you have, um, by force of the Carbon Rights Act, the legal and commercial benefits and risks arising from changes to the atmosphere that are caused by carbon sequestration and carbon release occurring in or on the land in respect of, the carbon, of which the carbon rights registered. You can deal with that interest, the carbon right, by transferring it, mortgaging it. Someone can lodge a caveat over your carbon right, uh, carbon right if they claim an interest in it. The carbon right in, um, holder can be the owner of the land. So if you own a pastoral lease, for example, you've got the minister's consent, um, you can register the, the carbon rights. You can hold the pastoral lease, hold the carbon right. Freehold land, you own the land, you can also own the, the carbon right. Um, the area of land um, that's the subject of the carbon right is, is required to be detailed in a form, of course, so you can register the carbon right over the whole of the land, but more typically you would do it in relation to a defined area of the land. Um, and these days with land gate requirement, uh, requirements and um, technology around sur surveying, you can create a deposited plan that shows that the area of your, your carbon project in very defined portions of the, of the land. The Carbon Rights Act also allows for the registration of carbon covenants, um, which impose requirements and restrictions in relation to um, activities that may affect the carbon sequestration or carbon release of the land. So effectively, a carbon covenant is something that protects the interests of the carbon right holder and has to be held by the carbon right holder. Um, becomes an encumbrance on the land, so runs with the land or bind any subsequent purchaser of the land. So what are the issues with the registration of, uh, of carbon rights on Crown land? <coughs> the Carbon Rights Act, as I've said, specifically provides for the registration of carbon rights on, on Crown land and so does the Land Administration Act of Section 18A that I've, I've got up there that says the minister may apply for the state to be registered as carbon right owner. So no one else, the state, enter into a carbon covenant and deal with a carbon right or carbon <coughs> covenant. So for example, transfer the, the carbon right to someone who's um, conducting or proposing to conduct a, a carbon project. As far as the CFI is concerned and, and projects under the CFI, once the, the carbon right is registered by the state, the state can then consent to a project proponent carrying out a CFI project as an alternative to actually transferring the carbon right to that um, project proponent. But it hasn't happened yet. That is, as far as I know, no one has registered uh, a carbon right over Crown land. There are various reasons for that. Um, first one's um, not rocket science, no one's asked, um, which is very understandable in, a, in, in an environment where we, we don't have the mechanisms um, and the processes and the policy for, for doing that at the moment. So there's a cost to being a first mover, um, a cost that uh, many people here would understand. Um, but on that, that question, if there's anyone in the room that, that has some experience of asking or thinking about asking for carbon rights in that land, we'd be very interested to hear from you during our panel discussion. As I said, there is no government policy at the moment about who should the government give carbon <coughs> rights to or give the benefit of carbon rights to, um, on, in what situations and, and on what terms. What does the government get back from, from the, the issue of a carbon right or the, or the grant of, a, of the benefit of a carbon right in terms of dollars or, or anything else. Um, and one of the reasons um, for, for there being no activity here at the moment has historically been that there's been a concern at the state level with the potential liability, um, the, the state being left holding the can for failed carbon projects and potentially with a liability to, to, to refund or return or buy from the market and, and send back to the regulator. Um, carbon credits that have been issued in relation to a project where um, the sequestration is now not happening or there's been a release. Those have um, been, uh, those concerns have been allayed as, as we've had a bit more maturity developed with the CFI and our experience of it, um, and in particular where it's become clear that 
the CFI has safeguards built into it in terms of there being no liability for a carbon release event like a drought or a fire as long as the project component allows carbon stores to regenerate. So that, that's no longer um, much of an issue. What is an issue is well, what are we going to do with, with the benefit of carbon um, ownership, carbon sequestration right on, on Crown land? There have been a couple of studies over the years, um, fairly comprehensive studies on, on how this might look um, and what the policy um, options for, for government are. And there's, there's been some experience in other um, jurisdiction and jurisdictions in Australia too. Those are a couple of main reports that, um, that uh, are worth a look in terms of um, what the recommendations and, and studies have been looking at. Um, both of which were commissioned by um, DAFWA um, a couple of years ago. A few years ago now. So issues with the uh, options that have been um, put on the table, um, they're them. Um, we're going to look through those, but I'm not going to analyse them in painstaking detail. We'll, we'll look through them. Um, comment on them and then we'll vote on which one we'll imp implement. No, we won't, we won't vote. <laughs> um, so four options. One is, and these are not in, in the order that, that URS and, and Outback Ecology identified them. One is to transfer the, the rights to the land manager, um, pastoral lessee, for example, free of charge. I think we'll vote for that one. <laughs> The second one to invite um, pastoral lessees to tender for the rights to carbon on their own land. So land manager gets first dibs at, at carbon rights on their land. Third one, call open tenders for the right to farm carbon on, on pastoral leases. And the fourth one is, well, government sits on the, the carbon rights, um, retains them, which means, again, registering a carbon right um, and then retaining ownership of that and then contracts with pastoral lessees for the, for the management of the, of the Crown's carbon, so basically a con contractual arrangement. Options one sounds great for, for pastoral lessees. Um, not, not so good potentially for, um, for, for the state in, in terms of giving a, a new property right to um, an existing um, property holder. But it's not a free kick. Um, certainly, it makes lots of practical sense in terms of the land manager on a pastoral lease, for example, being in the, in the best position to control carbon stores on that land through its day-to-day -day activities. Uh, the grant of a carbon right to a pastoral lessee, for example, would provide um, a good motivation for increasing the carbon store in their land, looking after their land. Um, not that um, most of us need it, but in pressing in you know, economic times, um, anything helps. And uh, uh, again, would provide a, a reward for a good environmental stewardship of, of um, pastoral properties. Um, a, a few more uh, comments on, on the options that have been developed and, and put forward. One is that a lot of these options not involving giving the carbon right to the, to the land manager um, refers to the state purchasing back grazing rights from um, from the, the, the pastoral lessee in this case. I'm not sure, um, not having been close to those reports, um, why that's referred to. I mean, generally, the idea is that pastoral lease or pastoral use on a on, on pastoral lease would, would remain and would be continued to be pursued in conjunction with other activities. Here, we're talking about um, carbon farming. But it has to be acknowledged there is the potential for, for conflict over land use and for carbon farming projects to constrain um, pastoral production. So perhaps um, the question should be, well, where someone other than the, the, the pastoral SE has the carbon farming rights or the carbon sequestration rights to land, should there be some form of compensation um, for reducing stocking rates, etc.? And another point is that the, the options raised refer to uh, the potential for or encouragement of the conversion of pastoral leases to, to rangelands leases. Rangelands lease being a beast that, again, many of you would have heard about 
part of the, land, the rangelands reform um, project and a tenure that, or proposed new tenure that has been developed you know, specifically to allow uses like carbon farming. Um, conversion to a rangelands lease isn't necessarily required um, to facilitate um, carbon farming, although it would be um, cleaner to have that type of arrangement. So that's um, carbon sequestration, and that's suitable land tenure. Um, looking at the different types of tenure that we hold in the, in the <coughs> rangelands, there's not much freehold, but that's fine. There's no issue with uh, conducting whatever you, you like to conduct in terms of carbon sequestration activities on freehold land, as long as you've got the relevant planning approvals, etc. Exclusive possession um, native title land, again, fine, because the CFI uh, automatically gives the holder of uh, native title rights over exclusive possession native title land the right to conduct projects. Unallocated pound land, well, needs allocation, um, um, pretty obviously, before you can go about conducting uh, sequestration activities. Pastoral lease, um, now we come to the crux of it. Is a pastoral lease potentially a suitable land tenure for conducting carbon farming um, activities? A few questions here. Um, is carbon farming a pastoral purpose? The station holders among you will be familiar with uh, the fact that the carbon lease, uh, sorry, a, a pastoral lease can only be used for pastoral purposes without a, a diversification permit. Um, there's a definition there that um, you'll all be familiar with and I won't bother reading out, um, but it's a reasonably broad one. Um, and depending on the actual sequestration activities, it might be that they, they fall within that definition. Encouragingly, the Department of Lands has, has uh, states in its pastoral purposes framework that ecosystem restoration activities do not require a permit as they are considered a pastoral purpose. Um, another issue under pastoral leases is, is that a lessee can only sell um, a product of a non-pastoral use of land in accordance with the diversification permit. Is a carbon credit um, a product of a non-pastoral lease? Well, potentially not um, if it's within the, the pastoral purposes um, definition. But some clarity around um, whether, it, whether it is would be uh, ideal to, to generate a good um, investment environment. Additionality, we've touched on this bef that before, um, so no need, more need to be said at the moment. Permanence, again, we've looked at that before. There's a built-in inefficiency with having a tenure that lasts for less than 100 years in terms of your ability to generate carbon permits. So what's being done? Rangelands reform is the short answer. Um, there's very much a focus on getting the rangelands reform um, proposals through um, as the foundation stone of facilitating carbon farming in Western Australian rangelands before anything else is done. Rangelands lease um, is the centrepiece of that um, reform and we've got on the, the screen um, the, the basic criteria for or the purposes, or potential purposes for, for a rangelands lease. Carbon farming isn't specifically mentioned in the proposed bill as a, um, as a permitted use, but it's clear that the, the, the um, draft bill contemplates um, that use from the, from the information that's been put out by the department. What needs to be done, to, to, uh, from a Western Australian regulatory point of view, rangelands reform is, is um, pretty critical to the process. Everyone will be aware that there's some contro controversy with the proposed draft bill, um, and we're not here to debate that today. But the elements of the rangelands reform are important to facilitating um, carbon farming in the rangelands. Second one is po state policy. We really need to know what the state says and thinks and will allow in terms of potentially allowing carbon farming on pastoral leases and who gets the benefit of, of uh, carbon rights. There is some tension between the state and Commonwealth regulation in this field. Um, the CFI, as, as, as I've said, gives exclusive possession native title holders certain, certain rights that they don't get and is inconsistent with the Carbon Rights Act. Carbon Rights Act says it applies only to carbon rights. CFI overrides that. So there's some tension there and specific tension in relation to Savannah Burning, for example, that that will need to be overcome. We need a, a, range, a, a sort of a 
a CFI methodology that works um, for us on the rangelands, and you'll hear more about that. And we'll need to get together on, on native title, which is where, where Reese will be talking uh, about in more detail now. Thank you. Thank you.